The king suddenly was taken and smitten with a frenzy, and his wit and reason withdrawn. Shortly after the news of Gascony's fall reached London, Henry VI fell into a deep vegetative state. He would not move, would not respond to words, was almost totally limp, and could not perform the basic necessities on his own. Exactly what had caused such a complete mental breakdown in the king is still up for debate, although the fact that it occurred shortly after the fall of Gascony leads me to believe that the shock simply shattered Henry's mind. Henry's council tried in vain to keep his infirmity secret, hoping that he would recover in time, but it was no use, and the whole realm soon learned of their ruler's situation. Yet among this sea of darkness there was still a drop of hope. In October 1453, Queen Margaret gave birth to a son, Edward. Even so, if England hoped to survive the years until Henry either recovered or Edward came of age, the great lords of the realm would need to come together in a show of tremendous unity. Every important lord in the land, even the recently humbled Richard of York, was invited. However, this great council would soon explode in Edmund Beaufort's face. For immediately after Richard arrived, he had his ally the Duke of Norfolk call for Edmund's arrest for treason on account of his failures in Normandy. This implacable aggression worked, and the majority of the lords consented to Edmund's arrest. Thoroughly bamboozled, Edmund was thrown into the Tower of London. Third time's the charm, as they say. Richard, Duke of York, was, for now, top dog. Not everyone was pleased with this shift in the balance of power. Not least of all was Queen Margaret, who was on good terms with Edmund and did not intend to let Richard grasp power so easily. As she was in control of the royal heir, Margaret may have been able to form an alternative political centre to Richard. In 1454, she sent a bill to Parliament demanding to be made ruler of England with supreme control over government. This was refused. Margaret's position worsened when one of her allies in government, Cardinal Kemp, died. He was the Chancellor of England and the Archbishop, but since Henry wasn't able to select a successor to either of these positions, an authority crisis loomed. Richard was made the protector of the realm and the principal counsellor the, to the king. He had reached the apex of his power. Thankfully, Richard would prove to be a wise choice, for he was fair, just and dedicated to restoring the stability of England. Personally travelling north to settle the rapidly escalating feud between powerful magnates that threatened to rip the north apart. In this act, he was fair yet firm, and imprisoned lords which continued to break the peace. He made himself captain of Calais and Lord of Ireland, although this was because it was more conducive to strong leadership than, it, than out of any attempt to form a power grab. Even some of Richard's rivals, like Queen Margaret, would still receive lands during his time as protector. The key word there being some of Richard's rivals. Edmund Beaufort would remain locked in the Tower of London for Richard's tenure, a tenure which would come to an abrupt end. On Christmas 1454, Henry woke up. So almost as quickly as he came to power, Richard lost it again. Edmund was released from prison, Richard lost his status as both protector of the realm and captain of Calais, and Richard's appointments to government positions were reversed. Stripped of his power and authority, Richard could see that with Henry as king and Edmund whispering in his ear, he may permanently find himself an outcast from the realm. He saw the walls closing in and played one of his final cards. Richard went to war. He found allies among the powerful Neville family, one of the two factions in the north who had been warring for the past few years. Led by the earls of Salisbury and Warwick, they controlled much of northern England along with Richard, and soon they raised a joint small army in the spring of 1455. I need to make it emphatically clear at this point that Richard's only stated aim was to remove Edmund Beaufort and his allies from power, not to depose Henry VI. When news of this reached Edmund, his response was slow and lacking. Instead of raising forces, he moved the king and called a large-scale council at Leicester. York was summoned to the council, but I'm sure you can guess what his response was. Armed conflict loomed above them, and now the call went out for towns to begin raising troops in defence of their king. The gathering point was the town of St Albans, halfway between London and Leicester. The Yorkists moved in from the north, and encamped a day's march away from St Albans. A few negotiations took place, but these broke down shortly. Henry and his retinue set off from London to St Albans, but when news arrived of Richard's army, panic wormed its way in and Edmund was fired from his position as marshal in favour of Humphrey Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham. This was done most likely since Buckingham was on far better terms with York than Edmund, so the king hoped that some sort of deal could be hammered out. 
This was made far more pressing since Richard had 3,000 men under his command, while the Lancastrian army amounted to only 2,000. Buckingham rode forth and began to discuss terms with Richard, who had moved his army within a stone's throw of St Albans. Richard reiterated that Edmund must be removed from government and handed over to the Yorkists. This was unacceptable, and all Buckingham could do was stall for time. The time for negotiations was swiftly brought to an end, when the Earl of Warwick, bored of waiting, attacked the town without warning or command. It was the 22nd of May, 1455, and the Wars of the Roses had begun. Barricades had been erected throughout the town, but the Yorkists set upon them with vigour. After an hour of this, Warwick led a flanking party around Holyrood Street, and began smashing through houses and doors until a gap was found where they flooded in. The barricades themselves were soon overrun, and it seems that Buckingham and Edmund were caught quite literally with their pants down. Not expecting for the barricades to have fallen so rapidly, many of the lords, the king himself included, were only partially armoured, and soon they were crushed. Henry hid inside a building, while Edmund was driven into a tavern along with his son. He fought with valour, but valour can only get you so far. He was dragged into the street and stabbed to death. Only 70 men had died that day, but the victory was as decisive as any other. York had defeated his enemies, and now he held the king. York returned to London shortly with the king in tow, and was made protector of the realm for the second time. However, York's second run as protector would be far more fruitless and frustrating than the first. Firstly, the fact that Henry VI was no longer incapacitated meant that Richard's rule seemed less about the good of the realm and more about his personal power. Secondly, he was obliged to reward the Neville family for its support, and so he made the Earl of Warwick the captain of Calais and granted the motherlands in Wales. This had the effect of making Richard look far less like a unifier and far more like a partisan troublemaker. Richard's lack of support was made blindingly obvious when he tried to gather support for a second act of resumption which was soon turned down. Seeing his authority melt like summer snow, Richard resigned from his post as protector. The wheel of fate spun once more, and so as Richard's power waned, Queen Margaret only grew stronger. Following St Albans, Margaret had gained immense personal influence over the king, and many Yorkists in government were replaced by Margaret's men. She began to take a more involved role in the government of the realm, and further increased her power. York was consistently kept at arm's length, but Margaret did compensate him for damages done to his property during the conflict. St Albans had left England in a deeply fractious mood. Edmund Beaufort's son had barely survived the incident and harboured a deep grudge against Richard for all he had done, while Henry Percy the Younger had also lost his father in the fighting. This only exacerbated Henry Percy's utter hatred for York and the Nevilles since the Percy family was the other major family engaged in the northern feud which had been occurring for several years now. So with all this resentment and hatred boiling just beneath the surface of England, what could be done? Well, Henry VI had an idea, and it was just about as ridiculous as it sounded. The so-called Love Day occurred in 1458. Henry summoned many prominent nobles to the capital. These brought their own armed retinues with them, so once they had all gathered, the stage was set for a seemingly bloody battle. But Henry aimed to clear the air with a ritual of reconciliation and forgiveness. In short, the Love Day worked by having two people who hated each other the most walk side by side in the spirit of brotherly love and forgiveness. And so it left us with the rather laughable sight of Richard and Margaret walking, literally arm in arm, down one of London's main streets, along with many other nobles following suit, until Henry VI appeared at the back of the procession, walking alone. This achieved very little, and after it was over, everyone went back to scheming. Margaret removed more Yorkists from their post in government, and entrenched her position further. Despite this, Richard still had one key ally in a government position. The Earl of Warwick had been made captain of Calais by Richard, a position which granted Warwick an independent base of power and a source of loyal troops, making him a dangerous thorn in Margaret's side. He had been summoned to Parliament for strategic plans, but while he was there, a brawl erupted between Warwick's men and some locals, with Warwick nearly losing his life. Whether this was actually an attempt on his life organised by the Queen, or just happenstance is unknown, but it spooked Warwick enough, and he fled to Calais. 
Once again, tensions were at breaking point, and both sides prepared for war. The trigger finally came when Margaret called a large council and publicly denounced Richard. The only next move Richard could expect was for Margaret to denounce him as a traitor. And so Warwick left Calais to gather hundreds of men to his side, while making his way to Ludlow in order to rendezvous with Richard and the Earl of Salisbury. Salisbury had raised 5,000 men by this time. In response, the Crown sent the old Lord Audley to raise a force to stop Salisbury, and he succeeded in gathering around 10,000 men. Audley blocked Salisbury's path with an army, and a battle ensued, where Salisbury won a decisive victory despite the disparity in numbers, and Lord Audley was killed. Eventually the three of them met up, but Salisbury's army had suffered gravely at the battle, and despite their previous victory they were now outnumbered three to one. They retreated to Ludlow, and the two armies began to exchange light cannon flyer as a prelude to the oncoming battle. A battle which would surely see their armies destroyed, their families captured, and their lands confiscated. Richard and the Nevilles, seeing the writing on the wall, abandoned their army and fled in disgrace. Richard took one of his sons, Edmund, and fled for Ireland while the Nevilles, with Richard's eldest son, left for the north. Warwick eventually made his way back to Calais and began to build strength over the next few months. Meanwhile, the Queen was left in an unrivalled position of power and induced Parliament to pass the Acts of Attainder, which essentially amounted to complete confiscation of all Yorkist land and the legal annihilation of her enemies. Many of York's former associates were destroyed by the Queen, but she was still unable to subdue Richard, Warwick or Salisbury, for Richard had lots of support in Ireland and Warwick was safe in Calais. Margaret sent Henry Beaufort, the son of Edmund Beaufort, to deal with Warwick, but he was easily repulsed. Warwick did not intend to die in a foreign land as an exile, and so prepared for his return to England, gathering troops, raiding the coasts and even sailing all the way to Ireland to meet with Richard. Finally, during the June of 1460, Warwick made his move and landed at Sandwich in Kent. His army had been prepared for by Salisbury, who had sent an advance party to storm Sandwich beforehand. Moving quickly, Warwick captured London, and then advanced onward to confront the king at Coventry, gathering strength from noble lords as he went. Warwick's speed was truly terrifying, and the queen was completely blindsided by this attack, and faced him with an unprepared, smaller army. What followed was a quick and devastating battle. Within half an hour, some men defected to the Yorkist side, spreading chaos throughout the Lancastrian ranks. Warwick ordered that the king and the common folk be left unharmed, but that the nobility were marked for death. At the end of the battle, Buckingham and a slew of other major nobles were dead on the field. Left helpless, the king was captured for the second time. Margaret, meanwhile, fled to Wales. As September rolled around, York made his move and arrived in England but with a decidedly different aim in mind. Draped in lush royal robes, Richard returned to England a king. To say that this was shocking was an understatement. The Yorkists had never rallied against Henry directly, only to put a stop to his corrupt ministers, and this change of pace would prove to be a fatal misreading, and was a major turnoff for many of Yorkists' allies. Richard did this primarily because Margaret utterly despised him, and so would her son Edward. The only way, therefore, for him to survive would be to go with the nuclear option. He arrived at Parliament in London to lay his claim to the throne, and the room fell silent. The debate resumed days later, with Richard asserting that, since he was descended from Edward III on both sides of his family, his claim was stronger than Henry's. Ultimately, this was just a legalistic veneer for Richard's real reason for usurping the crown. If England wished to survive, it needed a strong king. The debates were fierce, but Parliament could not accept opposing Henry as a legitimate course of action, so they found a compromise. Henry VI would reign for the rem Henry VI would reign for the remainder of his life, but he would be succeeded by Richard, with Edward being made ineligible for the throne by law. Yet even after this staggering comeback, York could not sleep. Margaret would haunt him if he did. The Queen had fled to Scotland. While she was there, she got word that Henry Percy was raising an army in the north and saw perhaps the only opportunity to fight back against York. She sent word south to her allies, namely Henry Beaufort, with one request. Gather what men you can and march north at Godspeed. Trying to raise armies in winter was a risky plan, but necessary if they wanted any chance of victory. 
Eventually York became aware of these plans and gathered his forces in order to finish off Margaret once and for all. Richard reached Sandal Castle in December 1460. However, in his haste to stop the Queen, he had assembled a far smaller army than that of Margaret and spent a miserable Christmas inside the castle, while Margaret pillaged the surrounding lands. And then, on the 30th of December, a foraging party was attacked by the Queen's men. Whether it was out of rashness, miscommunication, or because he thought reinforcements were coming his way, Richard sallied out to fend off these men. It would prove to be the Duke's final mistake. In this terminal skirmish, he was outnumbered five to one, beset on all sides by men who genuinely loathed him. Richard's fate was sealed. He told his son to retreat, but Edmund was personally hunted down by one of the nobles whose fathers Richard had slain at St Albans and stabbed through the heart. The fighting lasted for all of an hour. He was captured, his helmet was torn off, and a paper crown was thrust upon his head. Before one of the soldiers decapitated him, Richard, Duke of York, was dead. Long live the king.